So the Sonic comic is finally dead. After all these years, it hasn't been officially announced yet. It's technically just on an indefinite hiatus at the moment, but if you look around, you can put two and two together. Like looking at the people who worked on it, you can figure out that it's fucking done. They're already looking for new jobs and listing Sonic under previously worked on. The people in charge are just pulling some cowardly, say it's on hiatus for months on end, and then announce it's cancelled after everyone has already moved on bullshit with us. And you know, I gotta say, even though I haven't read the comic in literally over a decade, I'm still kind of sad about it ending. The Sonic comic has been running monthly since November 22nd, 1992. There are 290 issues out, not even counting the specials, miniseries, and multitude of spin-offs, making it not only the longest running comic series based on a video game, not just the longest running comic series based on another media franchise, it is THE longest running monthly American comic to never be relaunched. Or it was, when it was still running a few months ago. And frankly, I used to care about this comic, like, a lot. So I'm gonna go back and discuss my experience with the series, what issues stood out to me, and the parts I thought were good versus what parts I thought were not so good. And just so we're clear, this video will be focusing exclusively on the Archie version of the comic, not the Fleetway version, because I didn't grow up in England. I did have some family who lived there, though. They sent me a couple issues, but all I can remember is that it was fucking weird. Like, there's some weird-ass shit in there, man. Like, what the fuck? One thing I do remember is that the Fleetway Supersonic is like a bad guy, or at least a raging, violent psychotic, which is a pretty interesting interpretation. I also remember there was this pig character called Porker Lewis, who totally sucked shit and was always crying about something or another. Actually, my favorite thing about Fleetway Sonic was that he was a complete asshole literally all of the time. Like, in the Archie comic, he's cocky, but, you know, he's mostly nice to his friends. In Fleetway, he's just a complete motherfucker. Look at this shit. Sonic, I don't like the look of that face. I don't much like the look of your face. Am I complaining? <laughs> Anyways, back to the comic I actually read. So for the first 25 issues or so, it's an extremely light-hearted, joke-driven, pun-heavy children's comic. The basic premise is that Robotnik has conquered Mobotropolis, turning all of its inhabitants into robots, and has renamed it Robotropolis. Sonic and a small band of freedom fighters, including Tails and Princess Sally, live in a hidden forest village called Knothole and attempt to foil Robotnik's schemes. If you've never read the comic, but this sounds familiar, it's because the same basic premise was used for the Saturday morning cartoon. And while this cartoon would be known as the quote-unquote serious one, these early issues are actually much closer in tone to the other Sonic cartoon, The Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, which was entirely focused on comedy and slapstick. I remember the first issue I ever had was number 8, which was all about taking the piss out of superheroes. It starts off with a crab meat getting caught reading Sonic comics, so Robotnik decides to scrap him for spare parts, as well as the SWAT bot who brought him in. Because why not? Robotnik is fucking evil as shit, dog. Robotnik then goes to a ribbon cutting ceremony for a toxic waste dump when Sonic shows up, so Robotnik signals for Botman to help. They fight, and when Sonic destroys it, Robotnik orders a Wolverine bot, but they accidentally send a Wolverkle bot instead complete with a joke about how Jaleel White voices Sonic in the cartoons. There's also a Spawn parody, and a bunch more. I think you get the picture in terms of what the comic was like. Just some wacky-ass, light-hearted fun. Issue 11 features a plot involving Sonic taking a shortcut through the Cosmic Interstate, where he gets lost and ends up in the Reverse Universe, where he meets the stunningly creative character of Evil Sonic. There's this baffling explanation about an imaginary dimensional line in the cosmic interstate where if you cross it, good and bad get reversed. Anyways, he eventually finds his way home and saves the day or whatever. Another issue I remember really well is Issue 19, The Night of a Thousand Sonics. It's high noon. In this issue, a portal appears and out comes a version of Sonic who's half cyborg. Sonic mentions something similar to this has happened before, like that time he found Evil Sonic, 
and postulates there might be an infinite number of alternate versions of himself. The Cyborg Sonic explains he comes from a reality where the Freedom Fighters were captured by Robotnik and turned into cyborgs, however this plan backfired as it ended up making them even stronger. In this universe Robotnik roboticized himself in a last ditch effort and ended up becoming even more powerful and is now threatening the safety of all universes. So Sonic convenes an interdimensional meeting of hundreds of versions of himself in order to combat the threat of Robo Robotnik. The Prime Universe's Robotnik doesn't take too kindly to this intrusion by Robo Robotnik, so he offers to team up with the Sonics as well, which they're begrudgingly forced to accept. Robo Robotnik has his own ideas though, and summons Evil Sonic from issue 11 to work as his ally. The coalition of Sonics make their way to the Cosmic Interstate and head to the Color Devoid Neutral Zone. There they find the Infinity Gauntlet, uh, I mean the Giant's Hand, in which Evil Sonic promptly steals from them. Once Robo Robotnik gets his hands on it, it unfolds and encases him in a huge robotic suit which he calls Giant Borg. This issue ends with the Legion of Sonics working together to take it down. Cyborg Sonic grabs Robo Robotnik's head and returns to his own dimension, never to be seen again. After this issue, there was a slow shift away from the three short, unrelated comedy stories per issue towards one long continuous story, as well as developing an underlying more serious plot. During this time, several characters like Sally, Tails, and Knuckles would get their own three issue miniseries to further flesh their characters out, and there were also a number of 48 page specials released alongside the comic, sometimes as tie ins for new Sonic games. One totally crazy ass issue was number 35. In this issue, Sonic collects his billionth ring, which sends him on a trippy ass journey through the cosmos. It's hard to properly summarize this issue, but there's some weird ass shit in here. Seriously, look at this. When it spiraled around me, it looked like a triple helix. Could our universe be one strand of DNA in a huge cosmic entity? Like, what the fuck man, that's some intense shit for a fucking Sonic comic. A storyline I thought was pretty cool starts in issue 39. Sonic proposes he lets himself get roboticized by Robotnik, and using one of their newly developed Neuro Overriders he'll be able to retain his free will as a robot. The plan is unanimously rejected, and a butthurt Sonic heads off to blow off some steam when he gets captured by Mac and delivered to Robotnik. He's then roboticized, and Robotnik sends Mecha Sonic to go kill the Freedom Fighters. He attempts to, and gets in a fight with Bunny. That was pretty fucking sick. Bunny's a badass. Unfortunately, despite being a half robot herself, it's not enough to stop Mecha Sonic, and eventually he manages to overpower her. During all this, Tails puts out a distress call, and Knuckles shows up to help. He's no match for Mecha Sonic either, and after getting defeated, Sally decides to initiate Operation Last Resort. This picks up in the 48 page special Mecha Madness. While Mecha Sonic is destroying an evacuated knothole, they bring out an old captured roboticizer from way back when they rescued Bunny, and Knuckles willingly roboticizes himself, able to retain his free will with the use of a Neuro Overrider. They then head back to Knothole and Mecha Knuckles attacks Mecha Sonic. They fight, and yeah, it's pretty fucking sweet. I mean, it's Sonic and Knuckles fighting as robots, I mean, what more could you want out of the Sonic comic? So after a while, there's a big explosion and everyone's like, aw shit, but it turns out they're both alive. Knuckles delivers the Mechasonic in critical condition back to the Freedom Fighters. The old roboticizer has a built-in reversal function, meaning it can de-roboticize robots that it created. So they're like, oh shit, well it looks like Mechasonic's about to fucking die. But they can detect Sonic's essence still inside of him. So it turns out Sonic's recently acquired billionth ring has surrounded him with a protective mystical aura. So using this magic energy combined with Sonic's biometric data stored in Sally's computer, Sonic is able to regenerate to his original form. Sonic wakes up and he doesn't remember anything since getting roboticized. He sees Knuckles and he's like, get the fuck out of here you fucking nerd. So Knuckles leaves all pissed off. You'd expect everyone to be super thrilled about having Sonic back and there'd be some sort of big happy ending, but they're actually like, hey Sonic, we specifically asked you not to run off on your own and get captured. You disobeyed a direct order from the princess. You're under fucking arrest. And the next issue starts off with him in fucking jail. It's great. They end up giving him 24 hours to prove his innocence, which he eventually does by capturing Knack. Some good shit. Mega Madness was definitely my favorite special issue. 
Either that or Supersonic versus Hyper Knuckles. There's some good shit in there too. I also like Battle Royale a lot. Shit, maybe I just like anything as long as it has Sonic and Knuckles fighting. There are also some other weird specials, like that time Sonic crossed over with Sabrina the Teenage Witch. And there was that one that was literally a Sailor Moon parody, complete with Tuxedo Nux. And there was the one that was all about girls. Hey, where's the all boys issue? You tell him, Sonic. There was that time they crossed over with Image Comics. So yeah, fuck the spawn mower. There's an actual Sonic spawn crossover. Some of the specials were fucking retarded though, like Sonic Kids. So overall, the specials were a mixed bag, but I mostly enjoyed them. Anyway, some more shit happens in the comic. They set up some running plot lines like Sally's dad, King Acorn, returning. Over the last 30 issues or so, they've slowly been introducing an underlying story, and it all culminates in the arc leading up to the 50th issue, the Endgame Saga. I'm briefly going to run you through the entire events of Endgame as it represents the peak of my engagement with the comic series. This shit had me hyped as fuck when I was a kid. We begin with a ridiculously dramatic tech summary of the overall situation. It is the year 3235 on the planet Mobius, and the war being fought upon the surface lands has entered its 11th year. A war that began as another had just concluded. A war that had its origins from the seeds of betrayal within. Like, holy shit, what the fuck? Remember what this comic used to be like? <laughs> okay. Warlord Julian had seized the power and authority of the House of Acorn and exiled the king forevermore to the Zone of Silence. Upon which Julian became Robotnik and began a systematic conquest of the now renamed Robotropolis and all its inhabitants. It is now the eve of what may prove to be the final battle between the successors to the House of Acorn and its usurper. Battle full of heroes and villains, winners and losers, those that survive, and those who have fallen. Like, Jesus Christ, they're making this shit sound like it's Game of Thrones. Okay, so issue 47 begins with a routine sabotage mission by the Freedom Fighters, along with some assistance from the Wolf Pack, some allies they made in a previous issue. Sonic and Sally are making their way to the target, with the rest of the team standing by. Sally's feeling a little uneasy due to recent developments. Her father, King Acorn, who had been suffering from a crystallization disease due to his time spent in the Zone of Silence, has suddenly made a full recovery. He also tells her that he believes one of the Freedom Fighters is a traitor working with Robotnik, and he thinks that it's Sonic. He tells her to accompany him on their next mission to ascertain where his true loyalties lie. However, she doesn't believe for one second that Sonic would betray them. They split up, and as she's rappelling down, Robotnik activates a bunch of turrets to attack her. The Freedom Fighters manage to take one out, but she's still in danger. They relax a little bit when they look up and see Sonic standing above her. So what does he do? He takes out a knife and cuts the rope. So basically, they freak the fuck out and rush over to help her. As this happens, we see Sonic confront Robotnik, who escapes with Snively as Sonic is left to deal with a laser trap. The Duck Doctor guy says that Sally's still alive, but barely. Her heart is very weak so they need to take her back to Knothole as soon as possible. The wolf pack stays behind and covers them, while the Freedom Fighters pile into a plane and fly back to the village, leaving Sonic behind. Sonic shows up at the rendezvous spot, but realizes everyone is gone, and makes his way back to Knothole on foot. So back at Knothole Medical Center, everyone's waiting for news on Sally. So Dr. Quack comes out, and Rotor's like, Is she okay, Doc? And he's like, Uh, no, she's fucking dead. So, understandably, they're pretty upset about this. Sonic shows up and is immediately put under arrest by Jeffrey St. John, the head of King Acorn's secret service. Sonic apparently has no idea what's going on and is shocked to hear that Sally has been murdered. Later that night we see Drago, a member of the Wolfpack, covertly meet up with Knothole resident Hershey the Cat. The next morning the King asks Sonic how he pleads, and Sonic professes his innocence. The King doesn't believe him, but decides to spare him the death penalty in honor of all he's done for the Freedom Fighters so he's sentenced to life imprisonment in a place known as the Devil's Gulag, as Robotnik watches and laughs from Robotropolis. Issue 48 begins with Sonic in restraints being led onto a plane, still pleading that he's innocent. Sitting behind him is a character literally named Sleuth Doggy Dog, who was revealed to be a traitor in a previous issue. The plane is attacked and it goes down, knocking out everyone except Sonic, who goes nuts on the SWAT bots. 
which includes this legendary panel. For the first time in his life, Sonic is devoid of humor. For the first time in his life, Sonic truly understands the meaning of war. So Sonic runs off, and we cut to Drago reporting the plane crash to King Acorn. The King bitches out St. John for letting Sonic get away, who swears that he'll recapture him. We see Sonic running with some palm leaves tied to his waist in order to cover his footprints, since he's hiding from both the SWAT bots and the Secret Service. He finds shelter in a cave and laments that they wouldn't even let him see Sally's body. He recalls that when his uncle Chuck visited him, he was told that the doctor wouldn't let anyone see Sally's final medical report. After laying down for a while, he soon passes out. Back in Knothole, Antoine is wondering why the King is having private meetings with Drago when they haven't been granted the same privilege, so they're covertly following him. They overhear him saying some pretty shady shit to Hershey, proclaiming himself to be a future Duke of Robotropolis and thanking her for her help. She doesn't appear to want anything to do with him, though. He informs her that Sonic has escaped, stating that he's counting on St. John finding him and them both eliminating each other. Antoine and Bunny follow Drago, but he's onto them when they're captured by SWAT bots. Sonic wakes to the growls of St. John's tracking dogs. There's also a bug plant in one of his shackles which is being used to track him. He retreats deeper into the cave, but the rocky terrain makes it difficult to fully utilize his speed. There's a confrontation between Sonic and St. John when we cut back to a royal meeting in Knothole. King Acorn has decided the Freedom Fighters Resistance movement has not yielded results, so he's decided to reinstate the position of Warlord. His choice for the position is none other than Dr. Robotnik himself. That's right, Robotnik finally shows up in Knothole with an army of SWAT bots and he easily seizes control. Back in the cave, Sonic and St. John are still fighting and they're getting pretty emotional since they both love Sally. There's a moment literally straight out of The Fugitive where St. John has him at gunpoint, well crossbow point, and Sonic jumps off a cliff. So the next issue starts off with the stupidest fucking thing in the universe, and I absolutely love it. So Sonic is falling, and he takes off his shoe and grabs some dirt or mud or whatever was in there, and uses it to create a small land strip which he then runs on to reach shore. This is absolute fucking madness, but you know, sure, what the hell, why not? St. John orders his men to go back through the cave and continue pursuit of Sonic, who's physically and mentally exhausted at this point. Back in Knothole, Robotnik reveals that King Acorn was nothing more than a robotic duplicate. He explains that he's working on a new powerful weapon of destruction, and he's going to keep the Freedom Fighters alive just long enough to witness every living thing on Mobius be annihilated. Dr. Quack is also revealed to have been working with Robotnik, but against his will, as his entire family is being held hostage. Next, something kind of weird happens. Sonic decides he needs some help, so he whistles by vibrating his vocal cords extremely fast, creating a super high-pitched whistle, calling his friend and fellow freedom fighter, Dulcy the Dragon. St. John sees Sonic escape on Dulcy and is pretty pissed off. Back in Hershey's cottage, Drago is admiring himself in the mirror. She's all distraught that the princess was killed, and Drago slaps the shit out of her and tells her that she's the one who did it. It turns out Sonic wasn't the one who cut the rope which killed Sally. Drago had convinced Hershey to wear a Sonic mask so she could help out with the mission, and this mask just so happens to have optic image refractors in the eyepieces, which make it so whoever you look at will look like Snively. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Wait a minute, what the fuck? That's fucking retarded, it makes no goddamn sense at all. But, okay, sure, whatever. I'll accept it. So, Sonic wakes up on Dulcie's back, and they're about to land on the floating island. Literally before they even touch the ground, Knuckles jumps out of a bush and assaults them for daring to set foot on his precious island without an invitation. Sonic and Knuckles are still pretty pissed at each other over some shit that happened in a previous issue. They fight for a bit, and trade cutting insults like a kid nerd and spine swine before St. John eventually shows up and says that he's the only one allowed to kick Sonic's ass. Next up is the finale, issue number 50. It begins with a flashback to some important lore of Robotnik, back when he was still known as Julian. He's running away from some other humans who are apparently hunting him down. He's found by Charles and Jules, Sonic's uncle and father. Apparently the humans on Mobius are called Overlanders, and there was a war between the Overlanders and animal people. They decide to take Julian back to King Acorn, hoping he'll be a useful asset for winning the war. Julian gladly divulges all sorts of secrets about his fellow Overlanders, and because he knows their weaknesses better than anyone else, the King grants him the title of Warlord. Although Chuck has some reservations about being led by an Overlander, 
Warlord Julian nonetheless leads the animals to an overwhelming victory. It's revealed this flashback is actually a dream by the sleeping Robotnik. Back on the floating island, Sonic evades Knuckles and St. John until Dulcie shows up and sets things straight. As you know, dragons cannot tell lies. That is why we can sense the purity of truth and I know Sonic is not lying about being framed. Uh, what? Everyone seems to be okay with this though. A dragon spoken word is fact, confirms Knuckles. Anyways, this apparently clears up the whole misunderstanding and they're on their way back to Knothole. They drop in with an aerial assault and reclaim the village, destroying all the SWAT bots. Drago runs away, but Hershey beats the shit out of him for making her complicit in Sally's murder. Sonic shows up and she confesses, but he forgives her since she was tricked into doing it. Robotnik wakes up and is informed that Sonic has liberated Knothole, but he doesn't seem particularly concerned by this turn of events. Sonic shows up to stop Robotnik from activating his super weapon, and does some crazy shit like modulating the frequency of his speed while running to create after images to mess with his opponents. He works his way into the facility, but it's too late. Robotnik activates his ultimate annihilator satellite. Sonic tries to reach Robotnik as fast as he can, but he arrives just in time to watch his knothole is destroyed by a massive energy blast, and he totally loses his shit. Despite the fact the Ultimate Annihilator is now malfunctioning due to a bomb set by Bunny and Antoine, and it's about to totally destroy the war room they're in, Sonic and Robotnik begin to duke it out. They don't exchange jokes or insults, they just beat the ever-loving shit out of each other. After a while, the Ultimate Annihilator begins to go off, and we see this sketchy image of Robotnik and Sonic fighting, followed by a completely white page. Eventually Sonic rematerializes somehow, and collapses. He awakens several hours later in a medical facility in Knothole, and he freaks out because he saw Knothole get destroyed. But Broder explains that Knothole wasn't actually destroyed, it now exists in a temporal rift three hours in the future. Uh, okay. Well, it turns out while being forced to work for Robotnik, Dr. Quack noticed Snively sabotaged the Ultimate Annihilator, programming it to affect only one specific organic pattern, Robotnik's, instead of the many it was originally programmed to. He also reveals that Sally didn't actually die from her fall. He lied about it and placed her in a stasis tube disguised as a memorial so she could heal and recover. He says she's alive, but in a coma, and he can't say when or if she'll ever come out of it. And you all know what that means, obviously. Sonic runs over and kisses her, and she immediately wakes up. And that basically concludes Endgame. Okay, so overall, I still really love this arc, despite some extremely fucking asinine plot contrivances that don't really make a whole lot of sense when you actually think about them. It's not the greatest piece of fiction of all time or anything, but as a kid I thought it was pretty goddamn cool. In fact, I like this arc so much that my dad, who also happens to be a huge nerd who likes to collect comic book art, managed to get me a page from issue 49 as a present when it went up for auction. So you might be thinking, well, okay, sure, Robotnik's dead, but I'm sure I'll be back in a couple months to start making trouble again. Actually, no. The Robotnik from the Sonic comic literally permanently dies in issue 50. Issue 51 is a celebration, like, fuck yeah, we did it! And the next two years is dedicated to an arc about reclaiming the ruined Robotropolis and rebuilding their old society, and all the difficulties that presents. After issue 50, Knuckles received his own spin-off comic, due to the success of his three-issue miniseries. Something kind of cool is that this comic would continue the trend of these three-issue arcs, and would often set up the covers for one long image which stretches across the entire arc. The series was also much more focused on these multi-issue arcs, compared to Sonic which was still mostly focused on single-issue stories. I don't really have time to go over the Knuckles comic too thoroughly, there's enough material there for an entire video. But it's mostly about Knuckles and his sacred duty to guard the floating island, his search for answers about his heritage and his people. It also features the Chaotix a lot, and a pink echidna named Julie Sue. But basically it's running parallel with the Sonic comic at this point, and there are a few crossovers and stuff. So the next 25 issues are... okay. There were some interesting ones, like a noir story which includes a cameo from MST3K's Crow. There's some I thought were interesting, some I thought were not so interesting. One I always thought was weird as fuck was issue 71, which even says itself on the cover. Probably the strangest Sonic issue you'll ever read. This issue is told in reverse order, memento style. During the story, a giant laser hits Knothole, which causes time to start running in reverse, 
So using his special emerald, Sonic starts running around so fast that he starts undergoing all these crazy transformations, eventually fucking with time itself. And the story ends with his appearance permanently changing to have green eyes and buckles on his shoes, matching his Sonic Adventure appearance. The issue ends with a cool shot of the laser blast that set the events of the story in motion. It's around this time that we reach Knuckles 25, in which he reunites with his long lost father. I gotta say, after this the Knuckles comic starts to get kind of weird. Like it was always pretty weird, but now it's doing shit like really focusing on the characters' love lives. Speaking of dates, won't you join us in Knuckles next month and learn about my special friend? It's not who you may think. What in the fuck? Like, you know what's a great way to start off your children's video game action comic book? A two-page spread of the main character's mom getting remarried. After this there was some weird arc about a purple ape man or something, and then the series was cancelled at issue 32 with Knuckles and all his characters and plotlines being reincorporated back into the main Sonic comic. So in the main series, the characters are starting to get some bad vibes. Some weird shit is happening, like that giant time laser for one. So they're like, oh shit guys, I think Robotnik might be back, what the fuck? So eventually they get in their spacesuits and go up to the giant satellite that appeared to confront whoever's been fucking with them. And in issue 75, it's finally revealed to be none other than Robo Robotnik. Yes, the very same Robo-Robotnik from all the way back in issue 19. So they fight, and eventually they escape while the space station blows up with Robo-Robotnik on it. However, due to the fact Robo-Robotnik is, of course, a full-on robot, he's able to download his consciousness into one of the many spare bodies he has prepared. And wouldn't you know it, he just so happens to choose the one that looks exactly like his Sonic Adventure appearance. And this is also when he decides to start going by the name Eggman, of course. So while it's true the original Robotnik never actually returns, for all intents and purposes Robotnik is now back and the main antagonist of the comic again, and just in time for the Sonic Adventure adaptation. This is where I kinda started to stop keeping up with the comic as much. Not that there's anything wrong with bringing Robotnik back, I mean what's the point of having a Sonic comic without Robotnik, right? But I was just not as interested in the comic at this point. It also started to get kind of, well, bad. I don't even fucking remember what happens in issue 100. They also made some weird choices, like Knuckles got infused with Master Emerald energy and turned green. This wasn't for one issue, like he's just green now, for years. For a while they did this thing where they made the covers look like a tabloid or something. I remember I really did not care for this shit at all. Issue 125 is actually the last issue I remember buying, and again I can barely remember what happens in it. I think they were doing their Sonic Adventure 2 adaptation by this point, but I had basically checked out and just completely stopped giving a shit about the comic at this point. I was just buying it out of habit. So apparently after I stopped reading, the comic continued its downward slide in quality until the head writer was eventually fired and Ian Flynn took over starting with issue 160. Ian Flynn is a cool dude. He posted my Sonic LP thread on something awful, and he even made a couple videos discussing the Sonic comics for it. Basically, he's a super nice guy, and from what I've seen of his work on the comic, it's pretty damn good. Unfortunately, I never actually bothered to get caught up on Sonic, and I only ever read a handful of issues after stopping, so I can't really offer any kind of meaningful review when it comes to the rest of the comic. But from what I read, it was good, and you could tell the people working on it actually cared a lot about Sonic, and there were cool references to the game and stuff. Maybe now that it's over, I'll actually read through the rest of it. The comic would go on to run until issue 290, and there would be several other comics, like a Sonic X comic, and a series called Sonic Universe, allowing them to expand on the continuity by focusing on characters other than Sonic, which I think is a cool and good idea. I know my permanent Twitter avatar comes from an issue of the Sonic Universe comic. There was also apparently an extended crossover event with a Mega Man comic, which is pretty cool. So did Princess Sally single-handedly lead countless people down the dark and twisted road to becoming a furry? Well, there's really no way to know for sure, but the answer is of course, definitely, 100% absolutely yes. But who cares? Who fucking cares? I feel like the fact some people jack off to this shit even though they're not supposed to affect your perception of the original work? Well, you're just a dumbass. You like the Mona Lisa? I've got some bad news for you, buddy. People have definitely jacked off to the Mona Lisa. There are people that jack off to just the hands of the Mona Lisa. Hell, there's probably someone jacking off to the Mona Lisa right now, 
as you're hearing me say this sentence. Does that bother you too? Grow up, you dingus. Hey, do you like that JoJo reference? Even this comic has made a JoJo reference. So do you see what I'm trying to say? This comic's gone on for so long, it's had so many artists work on it, to make a blanket statement like it's good or bad is just meaningless. Sometimes the art is good, sometimes the art is bad. Sometimes the plot is good, sometimes the plot is bad. If you want to find out what makes the comic good, you need to focus on the individual arcs, issues, and artists. A lot of really talented people have worked on this comic over the years. Like, pay attention to what Ian Flynn works on in the future. Another really talented dude who worked on the Sonic comic is Tyson Hess, who you might know from this wonderful Sonic parody comic, and working on this Sonic Mania trailer. Okay, so it's time to talk about the elephant in the room. Ken Penders. Ken fucking Penders. Ken Penders is a bad writer and a worse artist. He was hired by Archie to write for the comic fairly early on, less than 15 issues in. He got more and more control over the direction and writing of the series, and it was under his pen between issues 25 and 50 that it became less of a three-story per issue comic and more of an ongoing story comic. Meanwhile, he also wrote a lot of the Knuckles stories. In fact, the Knuckles comic was essentially his pet project, and he used it as an opportunity to shove in characters and concepts from a comic he wanted to write about magical super scientist Native Americans that nobody wanted to publish. He kept shoving in ancestors and relatives to Knuckles till things got totally outlandish. I mean, look at this shit. Look at these absolutely incredible original characters by Penders. Eventually, of course, the Knuckles comic was cancelled, so he had to start shoving the shit into the mini Knuckles stories at the end of Sonic issues. After issue 50, the Sonic comic really started to go downhill for about 110 issues, and eventually someone realized what happens and fired him, replacing him with a much better writer who actually liked the Sonic games and wanted to work with those characters, and the salvageable ones created by Penders, rather than insert a bunch of stuff that had no place in the comic. So after this, things were going great for Archie. Until Ken Penders sued them over the rights to the characters and stories he wrote for them. It would have been an easy thing to fight against, but unfortunately Archie either lost the paperwork that he signed when he started working for them, or he stole it on the way out and nobody noticed. Either way, Archie had to introduce a major universe-spanning cosmic event known as the Super Genesis Wave, which completely erased all Pender's characters and influence from the series. It was pretty fucked up, actually. Sega and EA were both sued over Echidna characters in Sonic Chronicles, and Ken Penders gets to legally continue his Echidna stories, just so long as he never mentions Sonic, Knuckles, Chaos Emeralds, or any concepts owned by Sega and Archie. So, what incredible new comic is he going to make with these characters he somehow actually managed to legally win from Archie? Oh. 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 This is fucking real, by the way. I am not making this shit up. From Wikipedia. Penders announced on his Twitter account that his characters were no longer Echidna, but Echidnya, an alien species. Penders stated the reason for this change was that he needed to make some adjustments to broaden the audience while making sure that longtime fans get their answers and resolution they want, and because of the difficulty he has seen with people pronouncing the word Echidna. Oh look! There's Jeffrey St. John, one of the characters Panders legally owns the rights to now. Oh Jeffrey, you were never a particularly good character, but you deserve better than this. Although I gotta say, move over Sally, Laura Sue's gonna be the next furry sex symbol. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Anyways, I guess that pretty much covers everything. Oh wait! I almost forgot about Sonic Live, the most horrifying issue ever made. I mean, do I even need to say anything? Just look at this fucking cover. Who made it? Who do you fucking think? The issue begins with a wonderful sequence of Sonic being killed. But it turns out this was just a video game being played by some actual real life children. So Sonic is stuck in some kind of purgatory or something until the kids get home from school. They turn on the game and are able to talk to Sonic, so of course he pulls them into the TV. Without asking them, I might add. So they go off to stop Robotnik or whatever the fuck. At some point someone explains to Sonic that he's just a video game character, which is pretty great. And eventually they manage to save the day thanks to Stevie's incredible ability to remember the level select code from Sonic 1. And then it's time to say goodbye and go back to the real world. The end. So basically it's the stupidest fucking thing ever. 
But just who were those photogenically wild and crazy kids anyways? Well, there's a paragraph in the back explaining how it's actually Ken Pender's son and niece. As far as their help was concerned, Ken was quoted as saying, Hey, they work for free! Oh, Ken. So the next page has the usual fan art found in every issue. Oh look, there's the drawing of that hidden image from Sonic CD, and... Oh my. Hey look, it's by the kids who starred in the comic. Now, I'm not gonna sit around making fun of children's art. I'm not a psychotic, autistic asshole or anything. But clearly this is just a case of nepotism, which is ironically how Penders landed his job at Archie in the first place. So this has just been my personal history with the comic. This video may have been overly long and rambling, but I just wanted to discuss my experience with it. I mean, it's not going to keep me awake at night or anything, but part of me is kind of sad that the Freedom Fighters are just dead characters now. Maybe if people enjoyed this, I'll actually sit down and read the rest of it. Or maybe I'll read the Fleetway comic and see what the fuck is going on with that series. Anyways, shoutouts to the Sonic CJ on ETI, the Sonic Mania thread on Something Awful, and Sonic the Hedgehog General on VG. Special thanks to Polink, who's a super cool guy and knows even more about Sonic than I do, and thank him for all that juicy Penders lore.